the Moroni Rapids, the only real rapids of the Missouri River. I really don't know. I thought it's doable and it probably is, but I felt the scratch like when I was almost over that ledge at the bottom. So I hit some kind of rock. I don't know if it's worth it, honestly. Like, you know, having fun for a few moments while wrecking your boat. This is the beginning of the journey. I want to follow America's longest river, its entire length, source to sea. Almost 4,000 miles across America, to the people who live here. I think the landscape really represents the people that live here. I think it's wild and it's rugged and it's uh, tough. That's where you came from, that's where you're going. The adventure continues. The ancestors are looking. The ancestors are out there watching you. From the mountains, the river flows across the prairie, the Midwest to the Mississippi, and then to the deep south until it reaches the Gulf of Mexico. My second leg will bring me from the Great Falls of the Missouri and Montana to one of the largest reservoirs in all of North America. Reason prevails. I decide to not paddle the Moroni Rapids. The boat is showing a lot of scratches from the rocks, but luckily there's no hole. I am following the river on small county roads across the wide open prairie of Montana. Until I reach Fort Benton. It was once the terminus for the paddle wheelers on the Missouri. Back when the West was still wild, and Main Street saw a lot of shootings. Hence the nickname, the bloodiest block in the West. At the end of the street, a statue of Lewis and Clark. These two names are inseparable with the history of the Missouri. I'll explain later. In the local grocery store, I can resupply for the journey. Then I'm following the Missouri across the land for a little bit longer, through big sky country until I can't go any further. Fortunately, there is Beth and the ferry. Hi, how are you today? I'm good, how are you? Great, thanks. I'm Dirk. I'm Bev. Bev, nice to meet you. <sighs> are you the Ferry master, or what's your official title? <laughs> Ferry captain. <laughs> Ferry captain, sweet. So yes, I am. How does that work? I just roll on and do you charge? Yes, but I'm worried about your hitch being a little low. Um, we'll have to probably lift it up a little bit with okay. your back tires. I do have some boards here. Okay. And it's a free ferry. Okay. Our county road service. So it's tax dollars paying for it. Nice. I guess I do pay taxes, so I'm yeah, a, I qualify go. to use the ferry. <laughs> Boards on the ramp, then we can try. Good so far. 
It's damn close, but we make it. Thank you. You're welcome to get out. I don't know if we're going to need it again. Right. Beth's grandson, Ethan, is helping. Who's using the ferry? Right now, it's mainly tourists. I get a lot of people out of state. I'm not getting any international traffic right now. Um, but in the spring and in the fall, I have a lot of farmers and ranchers that from Big Sandy that have land over here that they're farming and stuff. So I get a lot in the spring and fall with them. The Virgil Ferry is one of only three on the Missouri and Montana. It's been in service since 1913, connecting the banks and the people who live on both sides. So you're out here, rain or shine, no matter yes, what? Yes, doesn't make a difference. No rain. And year-round, is that? No, we run from April till Thanksgiving. We try to stay open for hunting season. Yeah. So that's usually then about the third week of November, so it could be we're snowing and... Does the river freeze over? Solid, yeah. It does? Yeah. And what's the best part of it, you think? The wildlife all the time. I get to watch the osprey hunt and the eagles and osprey fight and then visiting. I, my daughters tell me that I can talk to somebody for three minutes and know more about them. <laughs> so yeah, I enjoy that. Facts about their life. I gotta go turn this down. We are reaching the other side. Beth has to shut down the engine. Beth lives directly next to the landing, far away from any town with a dog, chickens, and turkeys. And the best playground in the world, in the middle of the prairie. To Beth, the big garden is more than just a hobby. Oh, is there too many Subsistence, taking care of yourself, that's part of everyday life in Montana. Yes, yeah, so I try to keep a good garden and canning. I can pretty much year round, enough food for that. I do pickles and Swiss chard and carrots and tomatoes and squashes, so it's a keeps me going. Raise my own meat. My daughters and I hunt, so we we get deer. Usually take them right out of the yard. So yeah, I could be self-sufficient real easy. Or I am. I only go to town like once a month. I don't know how off the grid I am, but yeah, it's a good feeling to be able to take care of me and my family. Life on the river, idyllic, and sometimes pretty rough. To Beth, the Missouri is home, the most beautiful place you can imagine. Ethan's your boy, huh? Beth has been raised on the river, together with her six siblings. It was an adventure every day. It was seven of us kids here, so we were either out fishing or we had our trails along the river we hiked on. Or, and my mother, she probably worried about us, but she didn't because we took care of each other, you know? And um, we were always fishing and swimming in the river, sometimes without her knowledge, but you just have to learn how to deal with the currents and and have some respect for her. So. Beth is saying that because she's had mixed experiences with the river. It's a life source. 
I've seen it do wonderful things and I've seen it do bad things. It almost took my brother's life. So it's, I have dear respect for it, but I know it's a life source for our farming and um, eating, so yeah. Beth gives me fresh salad, eggs, and baked goods. Have a great trip. Thank you. Then I head down the road to Virgil. It used to be a small village along the railroad line. Today, it's a ghost town. The only thing that remains is an antique shop and a few cabins to stay overnight. The next morning, I'm finally back on the water. I leave the truck and trailer for good. Ahead of me, the Missouri River breaks, 150 wild river miles. Over millions of years, the Missouri has cut deep into the prairie landscape, forming canyons and rugged bluffs. Missouri breaks, the river here is wild and scenic, as they say, because it's almost unchanged since beginning of time. And when Lewis and Clark were here on May 31st, 1805, they camped up here at Eagle Creek, and that's exactly where I want to spend the night. Lewis and Clark, America's heroes. In 1804, after President Jefferson had bought the so-called Louisiana Territory from Napoleon, he sent the two soldiers and friends westward to explore it. Their adventurous two and a half year long journey on the Missouri upriver and back became legendary and went down in history. And then it happens. So there's one boulder in this river, one rock, and I'm hitting it because I was just in awe of the beauty of the white cliffs. <laughs> that is just, I don't know. I may have to repair the boat. I'll check it when I get to camp, but it's just too beautiful and I'm too stupid. White rocks. That's how the locals call this grand, amazing stretch of the river. And I'd like to camp right here in the middle of it. That's why today's leg is already completed after just over 15 miles on Eagle Creek. Lewis and Clark had camped a little over there, and in their journals, they described this as one of their most beautiful campsites on their journey west, and that's easy to see, because it almost looks like a Western movie set. This is Montana at its very best. It's so gorgeous. After breakfast, I checked the boat. Yeah, there you can see the scratches from yesterday. If it's just the varnish, then it's not a problem. 
But if it goes deeper into the fiberglass and epoxy, then I have to patch it up real quick because otherwise the water will penetrate into the wood and damage it ultimately. While the boat is beautiful, it's also more fragile than a plastic boat. And I can't just drag the fully loaded boat onto the shore. I always have to look for, you know, rocks or some kind of uh, sharp object because if I would scratch the boat over, there you have your damage. But it's worth it. I love my boat. And then I meet a surprise visitor in camp. The next visitor is not such a surprise. I've known Jennifer from a previous trip. Her family owns the land here. For four generations, they have graced their cattle along the Missouri. So this is all your family's land, Jennifer? Yeah, yep, yeah. And how, how big is it? Like how many acres do you have? Um, this section's about 10,000 acres along the river. There's about eight miles of riverfront and then um, all together around 15,000 acres is the ranch. And for how long has it been in your family? Um, the original homestead was about 102 years ago, and the rest of it was picked up probably around 60 years ago. Before the settlers came, this land was home to the Blackfoot, Assiniboines, and Crow. The Native Americans have left their traces. Well, there's the pictographs. Wow. Yeah. Do you know how old? I really don't know how old it is. Um, I believe it's original, though, authentic. Where the buffalo used to roam and nomadic tribes had their teepee camps, today farmers and ranchers try to survive in the harsh vastness. Challenges are what Mother Nature throws at you, whether it's the grasshoppers and the drought, whether it's calving and it's 30 below zero with minus 50 wind chills and you're trying to bring a calf in and save its life um, so it doesn't freeze. I, it, it's, it's not always beautiful. It's often very difficult and frustrating and um, so many of the things that happen are out of your control. It's definitely not all romance. <laughs> Jennifer wants to show me her favorite place. Neat Coulee, a slot canyon created by water, wind, and lots of time. Like a gigantic climbing garden in the middle of the prairie. The further we are getting, the more the canyon branches out, and it becomes more and more narrow. The canyon can change almost every day. That's bizarre. Where would it go? What? I don't know. It's gone. Seriously, there was a great big boulder just... There was a boulder? Yes. But it can't just disappear. <laughs> it did. <laughs> so do you think a, a flashlight like kind of flushed, flushed it, it? Yeah. Yeah. Is that what it happened? That's strange. Wow. So in theory, if we get into a real bad storm, water would be gushing through here. Yes, I've always wanted to see that. We should time that appropriately. But that might be <laughs> also kind of deadly. Absolutely. <laughs> It's astonishing really that it's here. Like where did it come from? How did it get here? But just to come along and find this peaceful retreat amongst the prairie and the grass, the grassland, the farmland, it's just a it's a really great way to disconnect and get back in touch with who you are in nature, I suppose. It's fascinating how it changes over time as the water erodes it and washes away, sl the rocks slide, creates new formations, that changes the creek bed. It's pretty neat. Mm -hmm. It's getting quite narrow. I don't know, it was probably 30 years ago, the first time I came in here. I just remember being so surprised that this was here. But I always remember just 
you know, it was always part of the ranch. And for my children, I've, this was their playground. This is where they had their birthday parties, where they came to with their friends. We just hiked and played all the time down here. When a ranch or a farm has been in, in the family for four generations, my children will be the fifth. Um, we have a huge responsibility to take care of it for the future. If we destroy it and we don't take care of it, um, we can't pass that on. And once it's gone, it's gone. You can never get that back. It's already afternoon when I finally leave Eagle Creek passing the Grand Natural Wall. Millions of years ago, volcanic activity pushed lava into the rock crevices where it cooled down. Over time, water and wind carried away the rock, leaving only the lava wall. these next few river miles, there's a bunch of almost sculpture-like uh, formations of rock that all look like somebody carved them, and they all got names over time. So there's Steamboat uh, Rock, there's um, Citadel Rock, there's the Seven Sisters, and this over here is called Eagle Rock, because supposedly, with a lot of fantasy, you can see that it looks like an eagle sitting on a rock and just looking for prey, just gazing into the wide open. Somehow, I'm lacking enough imagination today. But it still turns into a great day. I'm in the flow. And the current helps me move on, one stroke at a time. Paddling almost becomes a meditation Time does not matter anymore. Like a fortress, Citadel Rock sits above the Missouri. I pitch my tent at the base of the hole in the wall. The prominent hole in the rock wall is visible from far away, a masterpiece of erosion. The next morning, I start on foot. I'd like to check out the white cliffs from a little closer. Here, erosion has not only created canyons, but also faces. as it gets. 300 feet above the river. 70 million years ago, this all used to be a sea right here, connecting the Gulf of Mexico and the Arctic Ocean. Then, the bottom of the sea was pushed upward. And over time, the Missouri has carved its path right through the white sandstone.
the bizarre rock formations continue. Next, I pass Steamboat Rock. It does look like a steamboat. And they actually traveled in steamboats up and down the river all the way to Fort Benton which is unbelievable because in the Missouri breaks, the river is so shallow, there's rapids. I don't know how they navigated through here. They must have been really good. The landscape slowly changes, becomes even more open. And after 150 miles, I am leaving the Missouri breaks. A new segment of the journey begins, the damned upper named after the gigantic reservoirs across the prairie. For a total of almost 1,000 miles, the Missouri has been dammed. The first reservoir is Fort Peck Lake, 150 miles long. And up to six miles wide, you can hardly see the other side. A sea in the middle of the prairie, with no current. At least, there's a little bit of tailwind. Just mosey on through the water. A little tail breeze going on. Feels like there's no effort almost. And I'm not complaining, honestly. I'm so thankful that so far so good. There's a few clouds inside and there might be a shower or so later, but as of now, just embrace the sunshine and being out here on the lake. Weather is a constant issue on a river journey. Alone, exposed to nature's forces for months. Heat, storms, high waves, lightning, rain, hail, and then all over again. Fortunately, it remains calm today. Wind in the morning. I'm not in a hurry to leave and instead will take care of my boat. Now is definitely the time to catch this because this is the clear coat. So there's, there's uh, four coats of varnish on there and then there's the epoxy with uh, the fiberglass. And once the water gets through that epoxy and fiberglass, then it'll damage the wood. And I want to catch this before it happens. Plus, it really looks shitty that way, doesn't it? So. Tackle it right away and have a nicer boat. My wooden kayak comes from a kit. It's made with okume plywood, flexible and light. Barely 40 pounds total. Yeah, she's a little more high maintenance than other boats, but um, she's also a lot prettier than the other ones. With new varnish on the boat, I'm going back into the water. It takes me five days to reach the dam of Fort Peck Lake. Next to it, the marina. Where I get out of the water, the sport fishermen put their boats in. Hi, how are you? I'm good. good. Not the nicest day to go out for fishing, huh? How are you? Rod Gorder lives Rod, close by. I am. He comes out on the lake as much as possible. If I go with you, can I also fish? Like, would you have a rod you, for me? I, I got all kinds of rods and stuff. Rod um, is inviting me to away. join him. Okay, so I just a need a fishing there. license. It's available at the marina store. So I think I want to try fishing today. Okay. And I'm not a resident, so okay. I need a license. Perfect, we can do that for you. So what are you guys going to be fishing for today? Well, I heard good things about walleye, but I'm not sure if we're going to be lucky, right? Right. Well, Fort Peck, there is some luck involved. The walleye fishing can be phenomenal, uh -huh. and then it can be pretty tough. I mean, it's definitely a fun reservoir, but it has its challenges. It's 199. Perfect. The last few formalities and a signature, and then we can start. The wind is picking up as we leave, and the ride is turning pretty wild.
we are heading towards a small island in the middle of the lake. Now why is this a good area to fish for? The structure underneath the water is uh, w what the fish like. Because the land slowly descends into the lake here, providing lots of food for the fish. Some of that, yeah. Also the that's red dot right there and then the arc, that's the fish? Yep, that's the fish there. Well, that might make it a little bit easier for us to find one. Hopefully, yeah. But we still have to make them bite. A lot of us tend to watch our electronics more than we watch the fish. <laughs> we used to read the fish as to where they were, but now we use electronics to find them and stuff. So yeah. um, if we had to fish without the electronics, a lot of us would have a lot of trouble now. Yeah. It's more about who can lie the best about the biggest fish they get. <laughs> <laughs> So how do we convince the fish to take our bait? We have to convince them with the right kind of bait. Oh, what do you have? Oh, uh, we've got some worms with us today, and we've got some leeches, just like that. Mm -hmm. And we'll stick it out. Up front? Oops. Okay, and then just set that in the water. Turn your pole around. And then we have to wait, and wait, and wait. Nothing is happening. You see any fish on your sonar? Oh, uh, I am. Which side? Oh, uh, right now they're just underneath of us. But they're not down on the bottom, so they're probably not the right kind of fish. But I'll just kind of wander around here and try to find them. Having fun's not cheap. <laughs> so is that something you can only afford because of your job with the oil industry? Retirement, you save up your whole life to, for retirement. So you can do stuff like that. So you worked hard and now you can play hard? Yep. That's how it works. It's the American dream, you know. <laughs> to retire and be able to do stuff that you wanted, that you've always loved to do. That's not only true in America. Working hard so you can afford things later. And what if there is no later? In the end, we haven't been able to catch a walleye. A woman on the river has had more luck. After weeks across Montana, I reached the second state on my journey, North Dakota. Right behind the state line lies a historic place. Fort Union, or more correctly, the replica of the Ford from the 1800s. Back then, Fort Union was the most important trading post for fur along the Missouri. How's it going? It's going well. Dirk is my name. Dirk, what can I do for you? I am greeted by a ranger in a historic outfit. Yeah. Come on in. Well, thank you. Oh, that's nice. Items from all over the world were available back then. <clears throat> this is not fully stocked, but uh, we were hoping to get this uh, off the 1851 invoice. Yeah. 250 different items from eight different countries. Wow. And then from, uh, we get uh, German trade silver, sleigh bells, and hawk bells. This is from Germany originally? That uh, is from Germany originally. And this is the only thing made in China in this shop. These are called ear wheels, and what you would do is you would run some thread through these small holes, make a loop, so it's a unpierced earring. So, and that's something that men would also men would wear them. Oh, to be fancy. Men have always been peacocks. <laughs> <laughs>
Very well said. It was the idea of the Native Americans to have a fort built here, directly on the Missouri. And that location, of course, was chosen because of the Missouri River. Mm -hmm. A uh, delegation of Assiniboine tribe wanted a trading post built, and they pointed out this is the spot to build it at. Mm -hmm. So it's close to the river, close to the Yellowstone River as well. And now the Missouri is not directly on the fort anymore. 700 meters further south. Uh, as Mark Twain used to say, the only thing that changes more of the woman's minds is the better the Missouri. <laughs> <laughs> really, that's what he said about the Missouri, too. Yes, indeed. <laughs> I reach the confluence of the Missouri and its longest tributary, the Yellowstone River. Its source lies in the Yellowstone National Park about 600 miles upriver, not far away from the Missouri headwaters. And just a short distance downriver, the next reservoir, Lake Sacagawea, named after the young native woman in Lewis and Clark's team. Right now, the lake doesn't carry much water, but it belongs to the three largest reservoirs in America. Lake Sacagawea is 180 miles long. And there, in a bay, lives a woman that all Missouri paddlers know and love. You have been away too long. I know. It's so good to see you again. How long Thank do we get to you. have you for? For as long as you want. Peggy Helen well, says is the queen of the river angels, the many helpers along the river who support us paddlers. Nobody takes care of us with such passion, not expecting anything back. Peggy runs a campground in the Tobacco Gardens Bay with sites for RVs, a marina, and a small restaurant. And we paddlers are spoiled with food, a cabin to sleep in, and good advice for our journey. She speaks to a lot of people in a lot of different ways, and you need to take the time to listen to her. That's why I tell everybody to go slow, enjoy. So, oh. They're just, you know, sometimes when you work in this business, we see so many people, and I think the paddlers are the highlight of who we are. We really take pleasure in, I take pleasure in providing a respite for everybody that comes here. To Peggy, the river is always female, a life giver. Like for almost everybody else, I will meet on this journey. Now look at the back. Isn't that cool? That is awesome. And that's a walleye? Yeah. This is tobacco garden. That's right. I think it is an amazing journey you're on. I mean, really think about it. Who wants to paddle from Montana to the Gulf? or even to St. Louis. It's a long way. It's a long way. And yeah. I, I, I know you know. Peggy wants to show me a historic site. She does that with every paddler. We pass countless oil rigs. Lake Sacagawea lies in the middle of the gigantic Bakken oil field. Over 10 years ago, that resulted in a true boom. North Dakota became the most important oil producer in America behind Texas. They put in a pipeline last year from this side of the lake to the other side of the lake, and it's the longest underwater crossing, I believe, in North America. It's down 250 feet below the bed of the lake. It was the craziest thing. We are approaching the historic place. It also has to do with Lewis and Clark. On August 11, 1806, Captain Meriwether Lewis was hunting when it happened. So this is where Lewis got shot in the butt by Cruzat. Can right. I say that? Yeah, yeah, you can. <laughs> I mean, it's the truth, right? It's the truth. 
And I mean, the rain is one thing, but the waves is like the other things for us, right? I mean, the waves for you guys yeah. is unbelievable. The wind makes that washing machine effect, so you're never quite sure where it's going to come from. Yeah. So. yeah. Tell me where. <laughs> we can use it. Actually, to be honest, I love walking in the rain grass. You do? I do. I do. I don't mind that at all. Yeah. Okay. So look that way. Uh -huh. That's where you came. Yeah. You've had a long journey, and you know you're almost <laughs> a third of the way through if I you're know. going to St. Louis. And if you look that way, that's where you got to go. Right. Look what lays ahead of you. Just better weather. <laughs> better weather, but the adventure continues. That's true. You're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for doing The next day, Lake Sacagawea is presenting its windy side. Near Newtown, the capital of the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara Reservation, I'm meeting Jason Morset. He works for the tribe and is not only critical of the oil, but also of the lake itself. Uh, all our homes are underwater. This is our first generation of living above the water. So like our fathers, my father included, was born in a generation where <laughs> they played in the water when they were living and being forced out of their homes up to higher ground to where we're at today. Our lands were forced into a smaller domain, mm -hmm. including what the water did. It's not its fault. It's this high. It's man-made uh, dams that made this Reservoir, I guess is what you would call it, instead of a lake. In the distance, you will never see our villages again. On the shore of Lake Sacagawea sits the Earth Lodge Village. It's a museum village with earth lodges, the traditional home of the Native Americans of this area. <laughs> Today, Jason is a director. The tribe wants to showcase its culture in a new video. We'll do one running. Can you guys run? They're going to come pretty fast. So we're going to kind of clear this area and you guys just run right by us. to capture the image of the horse and the man and the rider that long time ago when they did that those are sacred animals and they were part of our history and then that's also our traditional and cultural values that we possess as native people and that's what Jason wants to preserve Matt Eric we're gonna get one shot with this guy running go right by us cruising even if the scene is arranged, I still feel like looking at another time from the past. And I'm thankfully taking the photo op. Okay. The schedule is tight. The next scene, dancing inside the Earth Lodge. After the shoot, Jason can relax. We are on the other side of the lake. Look at this little vulture flying below us. That's awesome. He's gonna come up and see us, huh? He did. That's an awesome sight, but that's cool. Little, tur little turkey vulture. But yeah, the land is very important to us and we're gonna strive to keep it. And what does this water mean to you, Jason? It means everything. And that water is our life force. That's our power. Without it, right, how can we survive?
but imagine the trauma that you have to look down and, and not able to see your home again. Hmm. Just like any flood or any fire. That's what came. The pen is mightier than the sword, they say, right? So government made you sign something, that's how, that's how they defeated us. The trauma needs to heal, Jason says. That's why the Mandan, Hidatsa and Orikara are organizing a healing rite for the youth. Be with us today as we learn about what happened underneath this water. We're using our relatives, these horses, this horse nation to uh, help us heal and help us in any way that can happen for us to be a better person in whatever way they need it. I want that to be healed right now. As the riders are taking off, it is time for me to leave. Be careful when you're on that water and enjoy the land, enjoy the water. Just to keep our people in mind. The ancestors are looking. The ancestors are out there watching you. So keep that in mind and respect to them because they are very powerful too. Just like the wind, the sun, the rain, everything is powerful. Still, I paddle on, hoping that the ancestors mean me well on my journey. Thank you.